Good morning and welcome to our special Japan Society Saturday morning event. Our conversation with our old friend David Howell, as known as Baron Howell of Guildford, about what he has called his Japan affair, but also many other aspects of our modern times. I am Bill Emmett, and as you know, I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. I've also had the honor and pleasure of knowing David Howell for quite a long time although probably not as long as some of you on this call. I don't think David will mind me describing him as a veteran in many fields, politician, minister, journalist, consultant, and indeed friend of Japan. After all, David was first elected to parliament as the member for Guildford in 1966 and represented that constituency for three decades until he stood down in 1997 and was appointed to the House of Lords. David first served as a minister in the Conservative government of Edward Heath in 1970 to 74 in roles covering the Treasury, Northern Ireland and energy. But he really and particularly came to prominence during Margaret Thatcher's governments from 1979 onwards, serving as Secretary of State for Transport and then for Energy, which, as historians would note, put him very much in the firing line on some highly contentious issues of that time railways, coal, and oil in particular. Concerning Japan, I first met David when he had become the UK chair of what was then called the UK Japan 2000 group, a group set up by Chris Patton and Richard Needham in the 1980s. He, David and the group were kind enough to invite me to take part in some of their annual meetings alternately held in the UK and Japan. Naturally, as a visitor to Japan, I can especially recall time spent in onsen together with David and his Japanese counterpart, the late Moto Shina, no doubt discussing issues of great mutual and global importance. He chaired, David chaired the UK Japan group for 10 years from 1987 to 1997. Remarkably, from the House of Lords, David returned to government in 2010 as Minister of State in the Foreign Office and then as Chief Advisor on International Energy Policy. And all this time, David has continued to write, a profession he had begun in 1960 as a journalist on the Daily Telegraph, a role he in a sense resumed as a columnist in the Japan Times 40 years ago. He has many books, including several on economics and on energy, but I will particularly mention two one written 20 years ago, which was highly prescient, called The Edge of Now, New Questions for Democracy in the Network Age, and his most recent, last year's The Japan Affair, collecting his Japan Times columns over those 40 years. So that's more than enough from me. We're going to have a conversation, David and I, but I very much want us to be interrupted and guided by your questions, which as usual, you can submit in the chat function of Zoom. Please do submit your questions throughout our conversation. So welcome back to the Japan Society, David. Let me begin with your Japan affair and continuing with that metaphor, when did the, the affair begin and was it love at first sight? Well, Bill, first of all, thank you very much indeed for having me. I feel honored and delighted to be here. And thank you for that uh, recital from uh, the full criminal record. <laughs> thank you for what you left out as well as what you kindly put in. Um, now, in answer direct to your question, the, the, the two gateway characters to my involvement with Japan in the uh, 70s and early 80s, it was really um, two people uh, Julian Ridsdale, MP, uh, who I'll elaborate on in a moment, and of course Norman McRae, who you will have remembered very well indeed, uh, who wrote that brilliant introduction. Uh, uh, was it a was it an article or a book? Of Consider Japan, which frankly a lot of people in the, in uh, Europe and here in Britain hadn't considered at all, except to note that it was doing extremely well and pulling itself up from the darkest days of. 45 to turn into one of the largest industrial powers in the world. So those two were the eye openers for me. And I went with Julian Risdell. He was, uh, he was known as, he was, I think he was member for somewhere in Essex or Suffolk. He was known as the member for Tokyo um, <laughs> in the House of Commons because he was trying against a wall of ignorance and disinterest to arouse in 
uh, Westminster's mind and Whitehall's mind, much closer consideration of and work with and alliance with the like-minded uh, people in Japan and a general understanding of what was making Japan in turn into such a, a miracle economy so fast. So those are the two. And um, he took us off to Japan. Uh, I, he, he, he said he spoke fluent Japanese because he'd been, um, I think, part of a naval, a naval attache or some diplomatic status right in 1945 and six when the pieces, we were picking up the pieces after the war and beginning to lay the foundations of embassies and proper diplomatic relations again. Um, uh, he did speak a lot. We got into a Shenkansen train where in those days they still had um, a restaurant cart. They don't now, of course. And we all, two or three MPs, we said we'd love some smoked salmon. He said he'd fix that up immediately and gave long instructions to order up smoked salmon. And after quite a wait, something appeared which had no relation to smoked salmon at all. Um, and made me doubt slightly whether Julian was completely on top of all the nuances of Japanese language, but he was devoted to it. He was not a great orator himself, but he really worked away at bringing some of us into the realization of just what the potential was. Um, that's what started it. And then I had the good fortune to meet the famous Mr. Um, Suzuki, the editor of the Japan Times, and also the owner of the Japan, Mr. Okasawa. And they asked me to start writing a column. This is a, uh, 1983 after I'd left Mrs. Thatcher's government. And that's what I've done ever since. And then also after that, I was asked to chair the um, UK Japan 2000 group, which you mentioned, which had been initially chaired by Jim Pryor, started by the, particularly by Richard Needham. He really worked away on Mrs. Thatcher and the government to say we needed a sort of special kind of uh, committee or forum in which people from both sides, the top of our industry and the near the top of our politics could meet and talk about the future. Um, and anyway, I was asked then to be the chair, succeeding, I think, um, Patrick Jenkin. And indeed, I stayed the chair for 10 or 11 years um, and met the most enormous range of fascinating people. So that's, that's the, the broad answer to your question. And, and in those days when you were there with Julian Ridsdale and, um, and indeed in the 1980s when, when you'd um, moved on to the UK Japan 2000 group, what do you think we thought of each other, as it were? How, how, how were relations in those days? Um, well, I think the, there was a, um, about those who, know, who, who became familiar with Japan and its performance, I think there was considerable awe, actually, as to why Britain was not in the sort of high productivity, high tech fast growing race. On the contrary, we've been absolutely swamped in difficulties, uh, wage inflation of every kind, uh, weak sterling, uh, strikes, bad industrial relations, low productivity, everything else. And somehow there was some magic we could learn from Japan. I think that was the mood. Uh, and learn it, we, we tried to do. A, and I mean, I tried to learn it both at the, at the broad policy level and at the detail level. I remember driving with my family actually to a new uh, Japanese factory uh, making uh, components for television electronics. This is in the 19, must be in the uh, mid eighties. Uh, and they'd taken over from GEC, that factory, which had been a complete disaster. Of strikes, flops, bad industrial relations, low productivity, high cost, everything. And they'd absolutely transformed it. And um, I asked the, uh, new Japanese CEO there in the factory. It was a place called Her Warren, just outside Abadur. Uh, what, the, what was the trick was, and he said, well, the problem was we were finding pork pies in the television sets on the production line. And I said, pork pies in the television sets? He said, yes, because there wasn't a proper canteen and proper really high quality facilities. So we have installed the highest quality BD, uh, canteen facilities. And that has transformed the situation. In addition to which, he said, uh, there's the, the gulf. I said, the what? Gulf? What? Gulf, he said. And then it, I finally got from him that that was the second incentive. The first was to transform worker conditions and deal with one trade union instead of 10 and so on. And the second was, was a damn good golf course nearby. So that was Japan arriving in Wales and making a huge difference. 
Uh, did did Margaret Thatcher understand Japan? I mean, as you said, Richard Needham um, put a lot of pressure on her and, and, and educated. Yes. I think what, what I think the, well, I, uh, this is really the Richard Needham country, and um, uh, and also you mentioned Chris Patton and and a few others. I think did get to her that that uh, Japan's performance really needed a real one to one discussion. She she talked to Yasuharu Nakasone, of course, the then prime uh, Japanese prime minister. And they agreed that, that they wanted something. There were technology discussions, and there still are, and many, many good uh, forums, but they wanted something really, really high level. And that is, of course, what um, uh, we got. The, because and the, the ambassador here, Ted Cato, the one of the whole series of brilliant ambassadors that have come to London, we've been very really lucky to have them. Uh, he was very, very committed, as were some of his colleagues, to really elaborating an intimate relationship with Britain. I mean, the, the, the opening team on the Japanese side was formidable. It was uh, uh, Shocharo Toyoda for a start. He a member of that the family, um, the Ted Kato himself. Sonia Marita was there. Um, uh, Tadehara Sekimoto of NEC. Um, and the real giants of the Kaidan Ren were all involved in the UK Japan 2000 group right at the start. So I think there was commitment. I think Mrs. Thatcher did just have this feeling that in, in, in turning Britain away from sort of corporatism to market e economics, even if later on some people think she went too far, um, we got there were some tricks to learn from Japan, a country that didn't seem too obsessed by left and right and political philosophy and was more just getting on with the job. Yes, I think that's what, one thing that's interesting to me as well. I mean, I, I went out to Japan in 1983 as a, you know, as a youthful, you know, wet behind the ears correspondent for The Economist. Um, Hugh Cortazzi was uh, ambassador at the time. He was and, marvelous, and, yeah. And, and I thought, I, you know, I thought I'd, I'd sort of escaped from a madhouse, Britain, you know, with, uh, with coal strikes and railway strikes and <laughs> red robo and all of that um, into <laughs> a new modern paradise. But... When one thinks about it, of course, Japan has never been, and certainly wasn't then, Thatcherite. Um, it wasn't. It, while the industry ran, possibly, as uh, indeed in a, in a way that she would absolutely admire, um, the economy didn't run that way. I mean, um, Mr. Nakasone and the LDP didn't run the country in, in the way that she would admire. And I wonder what she, maybe she didn't really have enough time to, to understand that. But um, it, it was sort of chalk and cheese, as it were, in terms of, sort of economic policy, just not of a socialist nature. Yes. I mean, I think what you're talking about is even more acutely relevant now than it was then. That, uh, I mean, for, for the Western and the European mind uh, and the philosophical uh, approach to our politics and governance, the way Japan runs is indeed a complete puzzle. It's neither, you know, it's, it's not... <laughs> Uh, capitalist or socialist, it's neither collectivist or uh, uh, or, or centralist. It, it's it's a in every way um, runs on different lines, which I think we have to understand. We'll maybe talk about this more in detail in a little while, but it's certainly not dogged down with the uh, left-right debates, which still still influence very much Western and indeed British thinking about governance and and our political debates. No, I I, th I agree with you there. I mean, I think it's almost true to say that it's a sort of Rorschach test for everyone. I mean, you can see what in it, uh, foreigners see in it what they want to see. Uh, Lech Valenza famously described Japan as the only successful socialist country in history, um, <laughs> whereas others saw it in completely different ways. But let's move on to today. I mean, how do you see UK-Japan relations now um, before we move into the sort of uh, the rest of the world? Yeah. But um, you know, forty years to now, um, do we understand each other better? Well, uh, I think we do. Look, just first of all, to, to categorise my answer to you, first on the hot current issues, uh, and secondly on my rather sort of slower moving experience, which I've gathered from forty years of writing the columns and dealing with Japan and advising Japanese companies and having a lot and lot of friends in Japan um, from all parts. Um, where we are now is actually, it doesn't very much appear in the media, but 
a lot is happening between Japan and the UK. We've got we've got the uh, agreement, which uh, Liz Truss, the International Trade Secretary, negotiated with um, Jay Grimston and a few others, and that, I think that's pretty brilliant. It got got poo pooed by some because they said, well, there's not much in it. It's uh, you know, our trade with Japan at the moment hasn't been all that great, to my mind, all the reason why we should concentrate on it, and that um, uh, it's we've got all sorts of restrictions. Well, all trade agreements have restrictions, of course, but it is uh, actually just as good as, if not better, than the one we had by the EU when we were members, and um, it is a pathway, of course, to our membership of the even greater uh, a market assembly or forum or trade agreement, which is the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, now called rather clumsily the Com Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is very big, big business indeed. I mean, this is a vast common area of trade or common market uh, and um, happens to have in it six of the 12 members of Commonwealth our Commonwealth friends, and when we join, it'll be more than half Commonwealth countries. This is somewhere where we have to be as a nation. And so we're heading in that direction. That's very exciting. And the Japan agreement is a step in that direction. Then, uh, then things are hotting up generally uh, on the security side. We have now, just we just have President Biden's fresh assurances that he's going to take the, the Chinese buzzing of the Senkaku Islands, or the, whatever they call them, Daiwubi's island, is it? Um, much more seriously, and he doesn't want to see any nonsense there. Um, we uh, have uh, the whole Taiwan scene, which isn't, which is always part of the Japanese scene as well, hotting up by the hour. Um, and we can talk about that. Um, we have uh, the, there's the ongoing saga of Kim Jong-un and uh, North Korea. Um, which obviously worries the Japanese all the time, since when he does fire things off, they come whizzing over Japan, and it's all rather close, too close for comfort. Uh, Japan's had an on, -off, on and off role nowadays in our uh, uh, investment, particularly in our nuclear, uh, civil nuclear power replacement program. Uh, we might talk about that. I'm hoping they will come back in again, but there have been some difficulties. Uh, not, not to do with UK-Japan relations, but to do with the way we pay for this particular kind of low-carbon energy. Um, and then all sorts of defence agreements have quietly been sealed up between us and Japan, joint operations, joint uh, fleet uh, and operations of various kinds. So everything quietly is becoming, uh, is being sewn together between Japan and the UK in a rather heartening way. But so that's what's happening now, although you wouldn't guess it by reading the newspaper. Yeah, well, I always, I've always felt that uh, one, one thing about Japan is that, uh, I'm wondering I've got some echo on my line. I hope others aren't hearing it. But um, one thing I've always felt about Japan is that it's uh, almost a conspiracy against the media, Japanese news, in that, in that the, the, the event, the big happening has been abolished in Japan and everything is step by step. So that um, it's 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 about long-term trends rather than rather than um, sort of snazzy big big um, shocks and battles and and scandals and so forth, which of course is speaks very well of Japan, but is not all that easy for the media. <laughs> <laughs> but also, the World Trans. I remember one visit by a Japanese Prime Minister here, and uh, various talks, including I think it was in Mrs. Thatcher's time, and absolutely nothing appearing in the papers. And the Japanese ambassador saying rather mournfully, well, everything is so good and going so smoothly that there's nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about some of those sort of foreign affairs problems in, in, in Asia. Um, yeah, uh, actually, I'll read out a, a, a first question. Um, Timothy Bovey has asked, do you or how agree with Michael Green? I take that to be the American Michael Green from CSIS or wherever he is now that China will eventually seize the Senkaku Islands. I mean, how do you see this, this, this whole issue of China and the South and East China seas and dealing with it? I mean, is this a sort of the, the monstrous movement of a great power that simply is bound to eventually call our bluff on the, and the Americans and the British and everyone else's bluff on, this, on the Senkakus? Or 
or, or not? How, what, do you, how, what do you think of it? Well, I think it's ongoing push and shove. I don't think anything is inevitable. I don't, I don't really share the sort of high Manichaean view of a lot of, uh, of Mr. Pompeo, for instance, or a lot of, a lot of American academics, and indeed the whole American spectrum, right from the Trumpian side to the liberal side, as they all regard China as the enemy, it's going to be the clash of civilizations, Mr. Huntington tells us, and it's all a, a sort of the grand uh, standoff between the two philosophies of uh, the West and some indescribable Chinese philosophy that seems to end up in single non-democratic government and so on. And it's all hostile. I don't see the world like that at all, not at all. I think uh, all our systems under the influence of vast digital revolution are changing all attitudes of people to governments and to hierarchy and how they want to be governed are changing by the hour. And I think this is going on just as much in Asia as it is in the West. And uh, many of our leaders should really understand that more clearly than they do and continue fighting, seeing everything in terms of left and right uh, politics, which is the 19th century and the 20th century framework and decreasingly relevant to where we are now. So um, within that general context, I think it will be a question of push and shove in Asia, containment of, of China's uh, sort of tendency to be aggressive at the edges, rather exaggerated during the time of Mr. Xi Jinping. Um, and against that, a, a, a robust lineup uh, of uh, countries who want to see good trade with China, but uh, can cooperation on that side, but containment of any of their superpower ambitions. So it, it's going to be a continuing struggle. And I think it's important to get our mindsets right and get our alliances right in Asia. Um, we've got the uh, Five Eyes, which is a good arrangement, uh, which Japan helps and should be included into my mind properly as a number of Six Eyes. And indeed, we should have India in as well lining up gently, not as a sort of war line against China, but just making sure that they don't get away with all sorts of aggravations on the intelligence side, the cyber side, on asserting all sorts of territorial rights in the China South Sea. They derive from 2000 years ago, and I think are a lot of nonsense, and various other things. So it's containment, and it's gonna be push and shove, and Sekou is gonna be one of the issues that's gonna rattle on, and there are many other similar points where we have to be quite firm and quite clear, but um, hope that it doesn't escalate into a uh, real um, hard military confrontation because that of course would lead straight to probably nuclear war and total destruction on all sides. And do you think, I mean, just to explore a little on that, uh, that China theme, I mean, you, you're, the Conservative Party has got its China research group uh, nowadays, and um, perhaps you know one feels slightly jealous that there isn't a Japan research group until one remembers the fact that these research groups are always against something. The European research group was against Europe, and the China research group is against China. So it's probably a good thing that there isn't a Japan research group. Um, but nevertheless, does this reflect a sort of broad mood of confrontation, or or do you think it's something that will pass as people understand the point that you've just made? Well, I, I, I hope it will pass, and I hope that the, the Japanese uh, approach, which you've just, just uh, described, is the realistic one and will be more widely adopted. I, I mean, uh, blind, uh, <laughs> blind love of China, which was uh, a, a near tendency a few years ago when we were talking about a golden age of linkage between UK and China, is too far one way. But uh, Sinophobia, the other way, that we, against everything Chinese, pull out, abandon their linkage our linkages with China on the technology side, uh, on the health and, and pandemic side, and on everything else as well, and you can't trust the Chinese in any in direction. That is also an extreme the other direction. And there's got to be a balance. And it's a, a very difficult balance and requires a huge understanding of the way uh, Chinese views and policy evolves and where all the people stand in the in the uh, Presidium situation and in the uh, inner politics of the Chinese Communist Party. It requires that, it requires um, a, a degree of dialogue with China about what our common long-term interests are, and also great caution about some of the aggressive tendencies 
coming out of China, which are which are undoubtedly quite nasty. I think and Japan faces all these issues day to day, and faces the ambivalence of having most of its its biggest export market by far is China. Mm -hmm. uh, there are six million tourists from China in Tokyo every year, or well before the pandemic, and no doubt they'll come back. The uh, uh, it, I, I advise one uh, major company that has huge plants all over China, which have never been troubled, are highly successful, and no worries at all. Um, and yet, on the other hand, uh, at the public megaphone level, China apologizes yet again and again for the war atrocities and the horrors of Nanking and the Manchuria and so on. And China refuses and rejects these apologies again and again and says they aren't real, they're not from the heart. And, your people still go to the Yasukuni shrine and it shows you like you're still fond of people we regard as war criminals and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a, a sort of mixture where the less megaphone diplomacy we have uh, and the more balance and careful consideration we have, the more we'll be able to contain the situation. But it is tricky, certainly tricky. Now I'm going to read out a question from our friend uh, Tomohiko uh, Taniguchi. Uh, in Tokyo, um, on the line from Tokyo, and who has um, who has spoken before at the Japan Society on some of these issues, and um, he's asking a question about de defense cooperation, which which you mentioned, David. Um, so I thought I'd follow on with this. He says, "How best should the two countries, UK and Japan, institutionalize defense cooperation? Is there any?" synergy to be pursued among mini lateral gatherings among the UK, the US, Australia, and perhaps India with Japan, also in terms of military cooperation. Perhaps Japan joining the Commonwealth. Could that be more feasible now than previously? Okay. An array of thoughts there from yeah. uh, our friend uh, Tomohiko Taniguchi, former uh, speechwriter for Prime Minister Abe and a professor at Keio University. Well, I like all those thoughts very much indeed. Uh, I think the first proposition one has to get hold of is that the future of defense, yes, it will have its uh, aircraft carriers and uh, its um, uh, troops on the ground and so on, and its tanks and its missiles, but the future of defense really is going to be in cyberspace and in intelligence and uh, in unmanned, yes, uh, uh, unmanned aircraft and drone technology to some degree, both uh, airborne and water and subsea as well, all drone driven. Uh, that, and that is all a very, very high technology. And therefore, in the containment of China's moves in this direction on the intelligence and cyber side, we need alliances which are built on enormously powerful uh, technology, a grasp of AI and a grasp of all the intricacies of cyberspace and, in, and uh, modern intelligence and surveillance. Now to what are the instruments through which we should do that? Uh, I think there they are, the uh, five eyes extending to six eyes and seven, as I said earlier. Um, I see the, the rather Trumpian idea of the quad. Uh, that was um, America, Australia, uh, India, and Japan as a sort of lineup against China is, is also alive still. And that Boris Johnson is thinking about how Britain is involved in that. Um, I'm more a Five Eyes man than a Quad man, but maybe they aren't mutually exclusive, but generally the approach has got to be to concentrate on the technology side. Um, so all that is possible and I think is going forward uh, at a more immediate level, the conventional level, our actual exchange of uh, defense weaponry and defense technology and joint operations with existing forces in the of 20th century sense of militarism, of, of military arrangements, they're going forward. But it's in the, it's in the quad and the five eyes area that the real links of, of a, an effective arc of containment in Asia to, as I said earlier, deal with uh, China on economics, but not let China get away with endless uh, expansion and territorial uh, aggravation. Uh, that's where it all lies. As for joining the Commonwealth, yes, well, <laughs> Uh, um, I've had wonderful discussions over the years about with Japanese friends on joining the Commonwealth. The, I remember one discussion when it was suggested that Japan should join. I said, no, no, that's not going to work, actually, because you are 
uh, you have your emperor, we have our queen, uh, and the queen is the head of the Commonwealth, as well as being actual queen of 16 countries in the, of the 53 in the Commonwealth, the realms. And so it doesn't really work. And there was a long pause in my interlocutor who said, well, why couldn't we have a joint venture? A joint venture. <laughs> so I left it there, but uh, I thought that was rather an endearing response to the idea. But India, uh, Japan is interested in the Commonwealth. It's interested in very much closer links with India, which it has already, which is a, you know, the giant economy after uh, China uh, and coming on in sheer size, not yet to the kind of Japan, uh, America level, but moving that way. Uh, and uh, I think the Commonwealth Network has got a, got, got, is part of this jigsaw. I'm uh, uh, going to say, uh, Taniguchi-san has uh, has um, said about the Quad, um, just in a direct message from me, Andrew, he won't mention, mind me mentioning it, it's the sort of idea, the Quad is the sort of idea that everyone wants to own. You mentioned it as a Trumpian idea. Um, <laughs> Tomohiko-san has said uh, it, it was really Abe's idea. Um, I was reading a, a memoir of um, the former director of the CIA, John Brennan, in which he describes it as George W. Bush's idea. So <laughs> well, there you are. an idea that has, whose time definitely is, has come. Yeah. Um, let's, let, let me, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a jigsaw. It's a bit of a jigsaw. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Of, I mean, some people have asked, Larry Stone, I think, have asked about notions of a D10, of democracies 10, expanding the G7 to include Australia, South Korea and India. And um, there are media reports that Japan may have some concerns about such ideas from Britain. Um, what do you think of this sort of this this kind of notion of D10s or D anything? Well, and I have been thinking about it because I was thinking of trying to write an article on it for the uh, for my column for the the Prime Times. Uh, I mean, the G7 is is rather a 20th century thing, isn't it? It's a bit out of date when the you know the, the, the power has so obviously shifted in the world to not only to away from the West to, uh, to Asia, but uh, away from governments generally to uh, non-governmental bodies uh, and institutions uh, and arrangements, which uh, just move forward and network with each other quite independently of what governments may say and decide. So it's, it's a different world we're dealing with. Uh, uh, the lineup of... Um, trying to get to grow the G7 into the democratic 10 or whatever is proposed uh, is interesting. Now, I wouldn't sort of, uh, completely badmouth it, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make sure that it was, that it was uh, advanced on a clear understanding of what the real forces are now driving international relations. And they aren't the same as they were in the 20th century. They are quite, quite different. If that understanding is there, well, Let's have 10 like-minded friends. I think like-mindedness is, is the concept we want to cling to. Uh, and if we have like-minded friends working together, this is something which I've always been in favor of. In fact, I advocated in a book I wrote uh, called uh, <clears throat> New Old Inks and New Ties um, 10 years, nine years ago. Now, um, Yuichiro Nakajima, who's a board member of the Japan Society, um, mentions that um, he's a, a nephew of Moto Shina, um, who uh, you're, you're, you're co-chair of the, of the UK Japan group. Um, and as he says, uh, Shina-san was a keen advocate of closer US-Japan partnership as well as UK-Japan relations. So uh, Yuichiro is asking, how do you regard the arrival of the Biden administration and its impact, good or bad, on the tripartite power balance amongst the three countries? Would there be stronger U UK, US, Japan cooperation in, for example, how we deal with China, North Korea, and Russia? Well, you've touched on some of these things, yeah. the five eyes and the quad and so forth, but what do you think about the, the Biden administration and where it's going well, to be? Uh, just before I come to Biden, can I say a word on the lovely and wonderfully wise Moto Shina, who was yes. the chairman of the uh, UK, Japan 2000 group, as it was called when I was first chairman. Um, he took me aside, I remember, uh, after dinner in the embassy in Tokyo, I think it was a time when we were beginning to get a little itchy with uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who had been splendid in my view, but sort of slightly going over the top on one or two things. And he said, what you want to understand in Japan uh, is that um, 
here we regard prime ministers as dispensable. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this, this is accorded with our slight amazement from Britain that every time we took the UK Japan group to for its alternate years to Japan for meeting, they were always very assiduous that we should meet the prime minister. And the prime minister was always a different chap. It was a sort of kaleidoscope. It's changed now. Since then, we've had Koizumi and heaven. We've had uh, eight year, uh, magnificent years of Shinzo Abe. But uh, in those days, indeed, you know, the, the miracle super industrial power of Japan, as it was, was as far as its government was concerned, it was a sort of rotating uh, merry-go-round at the top. Far from there being clear leadership and political uh, dynamism at the top, it was clearly at other areas the dynamism was coming from. So that's my feelings on Moto Rufino, who I thought was the most marvellous man. Um, now, I've talked so on that. What, what was this, the, the, the main point? Is that Biden? Biden, Biden yes, Biden. Yes. Now, I think we have to be absolutely clear-eyed about America. You know, Trumpism wasn't just Trump. It was a, it was a product of a, of a sort of populism driven by the digital age, driven by connectivity, driven by transparency, driven by the fact that every, almost everybody or large percentage in America and in Europe have got in their pocket uh, their iPhone or whatever it is, which connects them with the planet on a, and gives them their own, in the Madeleine Albright's marvelous phrase, everyone has their own echo chamber. So the whole world becomes a frenzy of, of, of uh, opinions and polarized opinions at that. And this creates a sort of very bad atmosphere that we've seen in American politics. That's going to go on. And oh, looking at the seen in even wider historical sense, um, is not the United States going through what we in Britain went through, uh, perhaps a little more calmly, which is the unraveling of, of uh, sort of superpower dominance and empire. The, you know, the end of the British empire did create all sorts of ructions inside our politics with people saying, you know, we've lost our influence, why, who's betrayed us as a conspiracy, uh, the elite are undermining us and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I think we've long since got through all that, but it did create some quite bad undercurrents. Now, translate that into the American situation now with American primacy having passed, the America's unipo unipolar moment after the fall of the Berlin War and the end of the Soviet Union having passed, and a recognition that America's got to play the network game, no longer the sort of can be a partner with everybody, but not the leader of everybody. I think that creates a sort of internal feeling in America of anger and frustration, which is going to continue. And uh, Mr. Biden's going to have to somehow curb this and play both the uh, sort of karma international role, which America ought to play, and satisfy a lot of feeling inside America that they want to get back to dominance and their top power and China must be bashed on the head and so on. So it's, it's going to be very, very tricky for him. I'm quite surprised that he's opened his batting so early with the hard line on Senkaku and um, Taiwan. But I suppose that's necessary. That's what's, that's what's boiling up. I don't know the answer. He's, he's just got to play it very, very carefully indeed. And if he slides too far in the direction of, of um, America uh, the, uh, reasserting its leadership and so on, uh, that will backfire. Uh, if, on the other hand, he retreats into internal furies and divisions about wokery in, in America and all the very, very ugly currents running. Um, he will and plays no part at all in world affairs. That too will be our loss. So it's again, it's the that elusive middle way he's got to find. Certainly very difficult. I, I, I would uh, entirely agree. I mean, we are all happier, at least many, most of us are happier that uh, he is there than um, the alternative, shall we say, but uh, nevertheless, pretty diff difficult to have. But I think your point about, as it were, the waning of superpower um, dominance um, and the difficulty of adjustment to it is very um, important and thought provoking. And it brings me, I mean, I'm just going to pursue this question of the networked age for a moment, and I'll come back to you know, the excellent questions that are coming into the chat. But um, you talk about the America needing to come to terms with the networked age. Um, now, please, I suppose what I want to ask is what you see as the difference, or is it the same difference between us with the networked age and what we think of as multilateralism? Um, you know, one 
talks about multilateral institutions and you need to you know, reinforce the multilateral order that was set up after 1945 and so forth, um, to which you know, one is tempted sometimes to say, well, a, a little the equivalent of Stalin's how many divisions has the Pope, it's sort of how many divisions has the WHO or the, or the WTO or whatever. Multilateral institutions are only as powerful as the, as the countries that, that support them. Um, what is the difference in understanding this between the multilateral world, as it were, of these global institutions that were set up, although sometimes disregarded by America during mm -hmm. its day, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the network age that you're seeing and, 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 um, and identifying, you know, as I said in your book, 20 years ago, the age of now? Now, well, I think the difference is almost in, in one word. It's, it's a microchip. Uh, it's a microchip which has turned the empowered the Davids against the Goliaths. It's the, here's America spending what is it uh, eight times as much on defense uh, and uh, vastly advanced uh, uh, military gadgets on um, than it, all its allies put together, uh, and yet it can't automatically win, and it can't win because the very genius, which ironically was originally American. Uh, which has now, has now uh, informed and miniaturized uh, and cheapened and multiplied weaponry has enabled small tribes and cells and groups all around the world to take power and challenge the hierarchies and the governments. And that applies to the vast military might of America as much as anything else. It's sheer military might doesn't deliver. You can't win wars anymore. By that, you will have to win wars by a vast range of intelligence operations and, as we were saying earlier, cyber operations and, of course, soft power of every kind, developing soft power influence in entirely new ways uh, in order to uh, hold your own in this network world. So that's what's changed on the pure physical side. That you can't, just by being big, uh, it is an advantage. In fact, it may be in a disadvantage. You become like in, like the giants in fairy stories, you become much more vulnerable and cumbersome and slow. Uh, and that's what's changed uh, for America on that side from the old multipolar idea. And then the second point is that uh, communications technology has so advanced and is so uh, ubiquitous that uh, and the connectivity is so great between non-governmental organizations or semi-governmental organizations and professions and interests right across the planet that um, uh, just saying various capitals are part of the multipolar system, it's still true, but it's you know, in every capital, the people, governments feel the pressure much more intensely. They're looking behind their backs. The governments are weaker and pressures on governments are stronger everywhere. And that means it's a new kind of disorganized multi-polarism, uh, that uh, multi-centered pattern that we're dealing with. I'm just thinking, this, just listening this morning to the pressures on governments uh, rattling around Europe over this vaccine battle. Everywhere, it's, you're, not, you're not listening to powerful statesmen saying we've got to get together and solve this problem and not quarrel and so on. We're hearing them, but you're hearing government politicians uh, who themselves are probably being bombarded a thousand emails a day, you know, or more, uh, by people saying, "Look after us, well, our country's the first, and don't you give anything to the foreigner, and so on." This is, this is connectivity and microchip pressure on a scale that my generation of politicians never experienced, and it's very, very intense, and it leads to some very polarized, extreme views, a total desertion of the middle ground where common sense and balance will prevail. And do you, I mean, I suppose the part of it that many of us worry about, certainly someone like me from the media background, is the, the, the prevalence of conspiracy theories. I mean, of the, as it were, alternative facts. Um, that, yes. Do you, do you think that that's, a, as it were, an inevitable part of the microchip network age? Or can, that's is all part of it. That's yeah. very, very much part of it. Everything becomes uh, sound-bited and uh, aligned at extremes and uh, things you don't agree with. Instead of it being argument and debate, it becomes their... Their, their news is fake news, even though they prove it, claim it's facts, it isn't. And our news is genuine, the truth, and the right, and so on. And 
So fake news become part of the story and, and claiming that all news you don't like, or all facts you don't like are fake is part of the story. And it's very, very difficult indeed for political leaders to assert kind of a uniting sense of governance over this pattern. This is what Mr. Biden has got to try and do. We've got to try and do here as well. Um, so yes, it's uh, all that, uh, very much the, uh, the fake news story and the um, hacking and the, uh, all the sorts of conspiracy claims that go on, some of them absolutely unbelievable. If you look at what QAnon are saying about the way the world works, uh, what was it that some of the whole, the whole pandemic was started by a conspiracy in the US embassy in Rome or something lunatic. Any mad witches of Salem story goes. Uh, and this, is, this can only be calmed down by very, very wise central leaders who can really regain respect and trust uh, for governance, which just isn't there in many countries. Yes, very difficult, very difficult. Now, that I better, with time running out, I better I whip onto some questions. Um, let's so shift, maybe slightly uh, shift to back into time, back to the 1970s. Paul Diamond has asked, um, Edward Heath's visit to Tokyo in 1972, he said, led to a significant new, new commitment to Japan in the DTI. Do you recall his own impressions of the country that drove this on? And second question, do you see a younger under 50s generation of UK politicians following your example of focus on Japan? Um, is there a gap or is there a, you know, a good generation who understand and at least are very interested in Japan? Right, uh, Heath first. Um, yeah, I think Heath, you know, Heath was uh, closely technocratic in a way. Uh, he, he didn't like left-right politics, which, of course, was his undoing in a sense, because he failed to pick up one or two crucial, very powerful sentiments, uh, including a, a degree of uh, not some crude nationalism in this country, but feeling we didn't want to be messed around too much. Uh, and he had a lot of bad luck as well. But uh, no, I think he understood the, the beginnings of the um, importance of the Japanese model and good relations with Japan and opening trade with Japan very well indeed. Uh, that's, that's one of the areas where, uh, although this offends all the uh, uh, enthusiasms of the um, doctrinal political commentators, there was a common thread between what he tried to do and what Mrs. Thatcher tried to do. He too tried to reform government and decentralize and privatize and deliver technically on a, a quality of government that Britain had not known before and overcome all the divisions caused particularly by industrial strife. Uh, just as Mrs. Thatcher picked up the same themes of uh, decentralization, privatization and so on, uh, eight or nine years later. And the same with realization that Japan was a serious force from which we had to learn a great deal and with whom we had to ally. So yes, Heath understood these things. Um, but later on, he got bogged down in all sorts of distractions and difficulties, and I'm afraid in the end made some one or two wrong judgments, um, which have made his uh, historical reputation not very good. Um, as for the younger generation, I read it, and I'm, I'm not of the younger generation myself. Um, I admire the way, incidentally, that Japan has de dealt with the a with the old age problem, the aging society problem. I think less emotionally and more effectively than, than we have. They've got a tremendous aging problem, but they do regard old people as an asset. Uh, they, don't, they don't go for this talk about the dependent old, old folk and so on. They try to assign everybody a job, however humble, but an important job and a role in their society. And I think that's a very good problem, model we should follow. As for the younger generation here understanding this, I don't really know. I think some of them may do, but they are being fed with a lot of polarized nonsense about almost everything, east, west, left, right, um, uh, the whole egalitarian issue, issues of immense importance now, like gender equality of all time in danger of being distorted by extreme views, as are all the very hot issues about um, race and so on. All these things can be de dealt with 
by wise leadership and calm governance, uh, but obviously are distorted by uh, hysteria and extreme views. So uh, they are exposed to not a very good lead, I'm afraid, from the media and from the opinion makers in the West, certainly. Uh, and we've got a lot to learn from how a country like Japan is able to deal with these things more calmly. Now, I've got a question here, perhaps brings it on to an area I've neglected, your energy business, um, and, um, and uh, climate. Richard uh, Siva um, writes, um, he'd like to ask you, David, what do you think about UK-Japan cooperation in the field of building an environmentally sustainable and climate-friendly world? Um, where do you think, uh, how do you think about UK, Japan and, and progress that can be made? Yes. Area? Well, we've both got a, an important role to play. Um, uh, Japan has gone on a different path on uh, new, low carbon nuclear power than we have. It's, it's rather odd because, I mean, we're now hoping that um, Japanese technology will help us with our replacement of our nuclear fleet so that low carbon nuclear can make the contribution that we need to the zero emissions ambition. We won't get there without a good wedge of uh, low carbon nuclear power, but for that we need um, reasonably priced electricity from reasonably costed uh, nuclear buildings. And Japan was going to be a great help um, at two stations at uh, Wilfa, uh, with, uh, that was going to be with uh, Hitachi, and um, more uh, in Lancashire um, with uh, Toshiba. But Toshiba pulled out for various reasons and Hitachi's found some difficulties and we've ended up with what, <laughs> what a lot of people don't like very much in the British scene, which is uh, big Chinese involvement, not Japanese. So that hasn't gone too well and I hope that can be reversed. Maybe if, if particularly if the, the Sinophobic mood uh, turns against China having uh, big involvement in Sizable Sea and in maybe in its own full-on technology uh, uh, station at uh, Bradwell, uh, maybe Japan will come back. Meanwhile, Japan itself, of course, after Fukushima has run nuclear power right down. It used to be about 30% or 28%. It's now about 5%. One or two stations are being opened again cautiously, but generally nuclear power is prospects in Japan are not what they were. So um, both, so that's the position on nuclear. Uh, on other areas, uh, Japan is trying, as Britain is trying to get onto a, a low emissions, indeed zero emissions path. Um, but if you want my bigger thought on all this, we can do what we like in the way of cutting down to zero emissions. We could close down all carbon emissions in the UK. Japan could make dramatic cuts, although difficult as they are without a restoration of their old uh, nuclear station uh, prowess. But at the end of that, our contribution is marginal and small. The big contribution to cutting emissions is going to be in America, Russia, China, and uh, Asia generally. And that requires huge investment in new technologies to wind down fossil fuels and wind down uh, coal-fired Emissions, which are going to at the moment be on a rising, still a rising trend, it's less than they were, but coal is still a major part of energy production in Asia. Unless we can tackle that, unless we can show uh, the whole of Asia, including China, including India, particularly, uh, how to produce reliable, affordable energy for millions, indeed billions of people, uh, where in many cases they've had no electric power at all made essential for their development unless we can do that with technology and technology mobilized on a martial aid scale a massive scale uh, emissions are not going to fall at anything like the rate required at the Paris Agreement let alone the 1.5 uh, goal um, 1.5 centigrade above pre-industrial levels it's not going to be achieved so we need to concentrate our views inciting though some of the many green issues are we're doing we're dealing with here and Japan is doing we need to concentrate on that fact if we can't beat emissions growth in Asia and in the United States and in Russia and other places uh, we're not going to succeed and we're not going to avoid the enormous dangers of a climate catastrophe which could
could lie ahead. Which I think comes back to points about you can't have a binary view of, of China or any of the other countries. You can't you can't be either a confronter or a collaborator. You've got to be both. You've got, got to be, be both. On, it's on, very on. tricky. You've got to be both. You're so right. Yes. Um, now, um, Andrew Fraser. I mean, just we've got four minutes to go, so I'll ask you a Brexit-related question just to uh, sweeten the Saturday morning for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Andrew Fraser has asked, he says, like many of your colleagues, you have sold the UK as a base for business operations across the EU single market, i.e. for Japanese investors and others. How do you interpret attitudes to inward investment in the UK now that we are excluded from the single market or rather we have different means of access to it and have only a thin trade deal with the EU? Uh, and I, I'll note that, you know, Nissan, uh, you know, pleased about the electric vehicle, electric battery provisions in the UK, um, uh, Japan trade deal, uh, EU trade deal rather, um, but um, other aspects of it, you know, annoying other people. How do you think about inward investment in the UK now that we are outside the EU? Well, um, first of all, uh, a, a salutation to Andrew, who's over the years made many wonderfully perceptive remarks which have influenced me a lot about <laughs> the way things are. We don't agree on some things but uh, he has a marvellous knack of putting very very complex points in a very clear way. So thank you Andrew for the question. How do I see it all? Um, the Nissan battery decision was obviously a welcome piece of news and there are others that we have to be and there was some relief I think um, in the um, Japanese industrial community and the Kadan Ren and so on, when we finally got the deal, just as there was some relief when the Brexit issue itself a year ago was finally settled. But uh, is it going to be a lot more paperwork and difficulty? Um, are there some of the news reports we've had already just teething troubles? Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the jury is very much out on these things. We've, uh, companies with which I'm closely associated, they're watching very clear, carefully. Um, the, they are part of the, the general view of heavy days of Japanese investment in the past, starting with Sonny Marisa and Bridgend and so on, that Britain was going to be the ideal place in Europe from which to feed into the European market. Uh, is that situation going to be severely damaged? Um, now, at least we've got the deal in theory with uh, low cost with zero tariffs and so on, but nevertheless involving all sorts of other uh, restrictions and difficulties and negotiations, which are gonna go on for years incidentally. Anyway, we're in, we're in a world of perpetual negotiation with Europe. This will go on for 50 years. But um, so what do the Japanese think about that now? I think they are on, on balance, uh, inclined to say that if, if the, the, the advantages of a slightly more flexible and agile Britain, uh, able to be uh, uh, a little more resilient in areas, uh, just possibly outweigh the disadvantages of not having that nice European single market customs union, no paperwork, uh, no difficulty arrangements beforehand, just. But I'm not sure that this has been finally decided by all companies. And, and some, I think some Japanese have indicated they're going elsewhere. I don't know where they're going because they may find even more restrictions across the channel. Um, and maybe they'll have to go like Mr. Dyson went all through Malaysia. Um, but uh, I think it's, uh, Andrew, I think that it's, it's a balance between the two, what you gain and what you lose. And it's um, on all these issues, we've all got yet to make the judgment. We don't know yet. And I'll just uh, uh, take uh, to um, remind everyone on the call that the Japan Society has got a webinar about this issue on Thursday with David Hennig, European Centre for International Political Economy in Brussels, and our own Vanilla Rudlin um, here uh, uh, in London, talking about, as you say, the teething troubles versus long-term issues, and in many ways the what Dennis McShane, your former colleague from the House of Commons, albeit on the other side of the house, has called Brexiternity, um, the eternal. <laughs> The eternal negotiation. Uh, well, I, with, I don't agree with Dennis on that. We agree about that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now we've reached 12 o'clock, but I'm going to lob in one final question that uh, Shigeru Araki has put in, um, just, just as, as it were to round things off. 
Um, he said, Lord Howell, how do you think of changes or impacts of COVID-19 in world politics and economy? He would like to have your opinion on the world after COVID-19, which is to say, as it were, you know, you've seen world and economic and, and, and political affairs developing over these many decades. How significant is COVID-19 in that regard, um, in your view? Well, I'm an optimist. I have to be an optimist. And um, I think if, if, if it's, you know, the choice is, it, has it uh, wrecked globalization, smashed supply chains, uh, accelerated the sectorism, that's the gloomy view, versus uh, has it actually brought all sorts of people together into a realization that these are global issues on a scale and at a speed and accelerated that kind of globalization more than ever. I'm on the second, I'm on the second, I'm an optimist. Um, you very kindly mentioned at the beginning the uh, uh, book I wrote or assembled of um, a selection from, uh, I think I've done 840 articles for the Japan Times over 35 years and we, about a hundred of them were chosen by Max Scott of Gilgamesh to put in a book called The Japan Affair. That, that ended in 2019. Since when we have had 2020, and so I compiled on my own account uh, another a sort of volume two of the Japan affair, which is just the articles I wrote through the gloomy year of 2020, which I called an optimist commentary and a year of gloom. And incidentally, uh, I mustn't uh, do book plugging. This is not the place to do that. But if anyone wants a free copy of the volume two, which is an attempt to cheer you all up in this uh, gloomy year that's just passed and turn it in the ghastly language of, of uh, PR people from, what is it, uh, make 2021, uh, 2020 win. Um, if you want to be cheered up a bit, if you send me your post address, I'll send you a free copy. Um, so I think uh, we can do better in the future. And that's, um, that's what I've tried to, tried to say in taking the optimistic view but out of this, people may be pulled apart and we may have rows about the vaccine now in the newspapers, but actually there are huge forces that have pulled people together as never before. What a wonderfully optimistic um, spirit on which to end uh, what has been a lovely conversation this Saturday morning. Thank you very much, David, for joining us. Thank you for your long, um, I, I say in a sort of pompous Japan Society, Chairman Wei, thank you for your long fealty to UK-Japan relations. Um, but uh, sincerely, I think you've, uh, you've uh, flown that flag uh, marvelously over all those decades, as, as you've described, and uh, future generations have to carry it on. Um, but thank you very much for, uh, for cheering us up and for joining us and giving us so many foods of thought that so many people join the call from all over the world um, speaks volumes about um, how many friendships you had and what a network you have set up, as you said, in this world of the networked, um, the networked age. So thank you, David. Thank you to everyone on the call um, who, who's joined us and um, hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I've enjoyed it very much.